Hello, I'm David Hunt, CEO and founder of the Hyperion Cleantech Group and your host for the Leads in Cleantech podcast. Um, just before we kick in today's episode, uh, through my work with the Hyperion Cleantech tech group, I get to spend quite a lot of time with investors and VCs uh, and to support them. And at the moment, I've got a couple of investor partners who are looking for long duration energy storage businesses in which to invest and uh, accelerate their scaling. So if you're one of those or you know one who could be interested in investment, please do reach out to me via LinkedIn or through the uh, contact page on the uh, on the podcast website. Today, I've got a great guest, Daniel Epstein, an award-winning uh, entrepreneur and investor and the CEO and founder of The Unreasonable Group. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Daniel, great to have you on the Leads in Clean Tech podcast. Yeah, I'm privileged to be here. Thanks so much, David. Look, looking forward to the conversation. Looking forward to it. And ironically, as we were saying uh, off air, probably we'll, well, we'll meet you on Friday with uh, a good yeah. wind and coming over for the next Unreasonable <laughs> uh, event, which I'm really keen to talk about for our audience. But let's start a little bit with... Yeah what being unreasonable is all about and how that came about. It's a quote I love, by the way, and it's 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 it's, it's something which has moved me. Clearly, it moved you some time ago. But for our audience, perhaps you can share what is the genesis and why unreasonable group. Why unreasonable? Yeah. Do, do the favor of rationalizing the irrational, seemingly irrational name. Uh, we're inspired by the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw. Uh, yeah, and he has a lot of very powerful quotes, but the one that I had latched onto while I was at university uh, was when he said that the reasonable person adapts themselves to the world, the unreasonable one persists in adapting the world to themselves. Therefore, all progress depends on reasonable people. I am, in essence, we believe if George Bernard Shaw is right, if all progress depends on reasonable individuals, then we can't afford not to bet on the world's most unreasonable people, which uh, we've internalized as as entrepreneurs. Right? They, they, you know, entrepreneurs have a curiously warped perspective yep. where most of the world sees market failures. They see market opportunities where most people see problems, they see solutions, and then they have the courage, I would say, because it takes a lot to will those ideas into existence. And so for us, the reasonable is about supporting entrepreneurs who are positioned to define progress in our time, um, to kind of lean on that quote by George Bernard Shaw. Yeah, it's such a, again, there are many things that point towards that. It's almost like, I remember people talking about yeah. Steve Jobs as having a reality deflection field. You know, <laughs> to some extent, you need that level of insanity 100%. to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> It's a strength and a weakness, David. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depends really. on who you talk to. <laughs> if it's your investor, then it might be a different story. But uh, uh, yeah. So, that, but it's quite a long time. It's over a decade ago that you founded, as I understand it, the, the Unreasonable Institute firstly, and obviously that's evolved into a number of iterations. And now we have Unreasonable Group and, and Investment and the like. So what part of your career and what were you doing at the point where you decided that actually this was your personal mission? It's funny that you, you know, my, my intro reaction even to the word career was, I've never had a career. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. Um, so and the reason I think I had that reaction is is my uh, professional life has, has been entrepreneurship. Um, and that's really where Unreasonable was born out of. It was it was my own experience. And in university, I, am, I, I studied philosophy. I was originally right. math, finance, econ, and dropped those degrees to study philosophy. For me, um, the reason I did that was twofold. One is philosophy was teaching me how to think instead of what to think. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, it was teaching me how to question, especially my own beliefs. Um, and that for me was, it was addictive. It was like hedonistic mind candy. I could feel, it felt like my brain was growing yeah. in these conversations where I would, I you know, have to question my own assumptions and align, align with them. Uh, the other reason I studied philosophy and dropped those other degrees was time. I Because I loved it so much, I, I didn't really have right. to go to class. I could read and write. I could be autodidactic kind of on my own, turn in the papers and do well in class. And then I had ample free time to apply these beliefs in the real world. And so for me, I was uh, 18, end of my first uh, semester at university. Okay. And I was sitting with my journal. I knew I wanted to be a quote unquote entrepreneur. I had no good ideas. Um, like I had a lot of very bad ideas, <laughs> but, and so nothing's resonating. So I'm saying I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what I want to do, which is very awkward. And, and I put on my 18 year old philosopher's hat and I asked myself the fundamental question, which is what is entrepreneurship? And I am, and I'd written on my journal, three lines on the first line. I said, all entrepreneurs design solutions to problem mm -hmm. sets. I wrote on the second line. Well, I can choose the nature of the problem sets I want to solve if I want to be an entrepreneur. And around the third line, therefore, I'm only going to work on problem sets worthy of my life's work. I, you know, I'm, I'm 18. I, I'm still foolish, but I'm really foolhardy then. 
And what I knew about startups in the entrepreneurial world is that it's hard. Yeah. The odds are stacked against us as entrepreneurs. Uh, still in the US, it's still nine out of 10 companies five years after formation don't survive. Right. And so I figured um, if I'm going to leverage my time, sleep, relationships, equity, you know, into starting something, well, why not work on companies that if we succeed, we, you know, bend history in the right direction, we define progress in our time because of the stickiness of the problems we yeah. sought to solve. That threw me down this path. I had launched three startups in university I am where we were trying to solve societal and environmental challenges, typically delegated to the nonprofit or the public sector. Okay. But using for profit, ideally highly profitable business models. And what happened was I didn't know who to hang out with, basically. <laughs> I got lonely. You know, I would go to the nonprofit profit or public sector. I felt like these are my people <laughs> who care about the same problems, but I was a misfit because I'm I'm a capitalist. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a better way of putting it. Uh, not not in heart, but in mind, in that I, you know, really believe profit's a brilliant driver for ingenuity, but most importantly markets for scale. And unless I was going to go into policy, which I am not, mm -hmm. I am. Um, I, I felt like uh, the solutions that I was examining needed to be not just sustainable, but ideally extremely profitable, so that they could scale yeah. to meet the you know size of the problem. So I went to the private sector, and in Boulder, Colorado, which is where I was and still am, um, most of the startup world here is in the tech space. I am mostly kind of software or yeah. mobile driven. I had uh, hung out with that community and said, well, they get that. These are my people. And I realized, dang, I'm a, I'm a misfit here because I don't care about profit in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's not the motivator. It's just the tool to be levered to get to the end goal of creating impact at scale. Yeah. I am, a, And so Genesis of Unreasonable was entirely selfish. And it was me feeling like a misfit entrepreneur and wanted to seek refuge amongst other misfits, you know, to have a community. I have CEOs and entrepreneurs and investors who shared this belief that I am, you know, we could lever this incredibly powerful tool called capitalism to create a more regenerative and inclusive future. And yeah. not just that we could, but we have to, right? The, and, and underpinning that, it feel, you know, this belief that there's a, both a moral responsibility, but also an unprecedented financial opportunity yeah, yeah. Uh, to do this well. And, and that was really how Unreasonable started. And we ran a, I am our first Unreasonable Institute in 2010. Um, I got addicted, I would say, in 2012, and that was then the creation of a reasonable group, which is what what we what we now are as an organization. Where we flourished, yeah. And that's an inter interesting point I went through myself, actually, until uh, about 2007 when I found myself, by a range of coincidences, starting a solar business, a clean tech business in the UK. And up until that oh, point, really? it was kind of like it, people saw it as a dichotomy of you're either... Yes, making money, or you are doing something good, and 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 to me, it was like there is no dichotomy. These things are not mutually exclusive, and I kind of found suddenly this, much better when you put them together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I found this brotherhood, if you like, and without being too cheesy, but brotherhood of, of clean tech entrepreneurs who were yeah very keen to do well for themselves and their families and and and, and build good, yes. sensible profit models. Um, but to make yes. an impact. And it's just such a wonderful environment yeah. to be in. And uh, I, I want to go back to Indeed. from your view on this, actually, because one of the strap lines on your, your website is about repurposing capitalism. And yeah. I'd like to get your view yeah. on, on what you mean by that and what the group means by that and how would you try and facilitate that? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big tagline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it should should say, play our part in repurposing <laughs> capitalism. But, you know, you want to keep it short and sweet. I am so... I think the best way to describe it is is a, a simple analogy, which is we look at capitalism, it's just a tool. It's entirely agnostic. It can be used, you know, to be extractive or regenerative. Mm -hmm. I am a, and I you know the analogy I love is a hammer is just a tool. I am a, and a hammer can be used to build a house or destroy a home. Right? It all it all depends on the intention yep. of the individual wielding that hammer. And as I when I was in university kind of scanned the globe. I realized, oh my gosh, for better or worse, and I could argue for worse if we wanted to, uh, capitalism is the most powerful tool of our time. Um, especially in the US, I, I mean, the tail that wags the dog in terms of how we even make policy yeah. is private enterprise. I am, and so realizing, wow, this is, this is the tool of this generation or of this time, then the question was, 
I am, you know, using the analogy of the hammers, how might we lever this incredibly powerful tool to, instead of being extractive and increasing the gap between the haves and the have nots, how do we lever it to create a regenerative and inclusive future that's much more equitable? Because we can, it's just a powerful tool. It's all about the intention. And as I dug into it, you know, I kind of realized that, of course, you can have profit without impact. I think that's part of the reason why we are in the challenges that we face today globally. Um, but of course that can happen. You know, you can also have impact without profit. That's kind of the maybe the noble work of the nonprofit world. But our our belief, and we think the companies we support are proving it, is that if you want to maximize either of those, uh, impact or profit, the key is to maximize at the intersection of both of them at the same time. I am a, and you know, we we look across the companies we support, and I you know, we think they're the future titans of industry. And they're positioned to help reduce gigatons of yeah. greenhouse gas emissions, let alone feed the world sustainably or in a regenerative way. And I am, uh, and we think uh, the entirety of our supply chains and how we consume and everything else. And I am, uh, and I, uh, it's just for us. So, how do we play a part in repurposing capitalism as we prove that belief yeah. through the caliber of the companies and the performance of the companies in our portfolio? That they will financially outperform the market. And that if you're an investor, the key for alpha is to identify companies that are solving harder problems. Because at the end of the day, if what we do as investors is value companies, it just makes sense that those who are solving harder problems that matter more to society and are doing so at scale are going to be valued more. It just makes perfect logical sense. And uh, we're trying to prove that through um, real world companies in essence. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of those. But again, just to go back to that sure. point of capitalism, some of your partners, of course, that you work with are big names in the capitalist world of banking yeah. like Barclays and Accenture and those sorts of people. So yeah. h- how did you get these on board? Uh, and I know I work with a lot of CVCs and investors and, and many of whom easy? are obviously clearly <laughs> impact focused, but these are kind of big, bad, you know, big, bad capitalist institutions. So how did you, got, how totally. do you start approaching these organizations to say, hey, I've got an idea? Yeah, I am. Um... It's a good point. So our, our, actually, just to comment on that, our economic model, most people look at it reasonable and they're like, what, what are you? And when I say, you know, what we do is we're trying to build the world's most trusted and influential community to profitably solve, you know, our greatest pressing global challenges. And people say, well, how, how the hell is that a business? <laughs> and there's two <laughs> models to our business. One, one is investment, but mm-hmm. the primary economic driver is partnership. And that's partnership with multinationals and some governments. Yeah. I am... What has happened is there's a sea change, I think, in the Fortune 100 companies. Um, and what they're realizing is um, not just that they, they have to orient around sustainability, uh, but that there's huge opportunity yeah. in doing that well and in transitioning either their services, products, or supply chains and, and operations towards sustainability. I am, they've all, most of them have made very substantive commitments uh, around, you know, maybe it's net zero by 2030, or Barclays has made mm-hmm. a trillion dollar banking commitment by 2030. I am into uh, decarbonizing the economy. I am at, that's great. The next question is great. Okay, we know we need to do this, but how the hell do we do it yeah. profitably? I am at, and so that that's why they've really come to us to partner with us. And I'm, what we're able to do is give them relational access to the future. Yeah. Um, what what has happened with um, you know S curves in technology adoption in terms of the rate of change? It is so blindingly fast that multinationals and especially governments they can't keep up with that rate of change. Yeah, yeah. And what they used to be able to do internally, they can't anymore. And so the challenge for a lot of these multinationals is how do I transition towards sustainability profitably faster? Oh my gosh, the only way I can do that and keep up with the pace of change is to become permeable. Um, and to bring the outside in. Yeah. But I have no experience working with growth stage entrepreneurs and figuring out how to integrate them into the matrix of my supply chain. I am, and that's where we, in essence, come in. And right. so it's it's a good thing to um, speak to those. And to your point, you know, Barclays is over 330-year-old 300, financial institution. I, but we've now been working with them for seven years and really through through our partnership, it's called Unreasonable Impact. Um, they launched the first new coverage group in 90 years right. as a financial firm. It was the first one on Wall Street. It's called SIB, Sustainable Investment Banking. I am first eight deals were in reasonable companies. And I am and I you know, we've changed or helped kind of catalyze change in their principal investment team. They just yeah. announced a half billion dollar 
um, new vehicle that's going entirely into sustainable solutions. M most of those are coming through their reasonable fellowship, their private bank, which is you know filled with individuals and families as clients. They're, they've been saying for a long time, hey, we want investment opportunities that that are not concessionary, <laughs> that yep. ideally outperform, but that are aligned with our values. Find them. Barclays did not have access prior to our partnership to uh, fast-growing private companies in, in the space of sustainability, and now we can bring that to their platform in the yep. private bank. Um, that's you know one example. Like Accenture being another you know very significant uh, partner of ours, and they're huge. Accenture. When I first sat with their head of innovation, I didn't believe him when he told me at that time they had half a million in place. <laughs> I remember googling under the boardroom table right on my cell phone, being like, "That's that's bullshit." Sorry, part of my friend. <laughs> so I was like, "No way." Yeah. I was like, "Oh my gosh, they do." They now have <laughs> over seven hundred and thirty thousand full time employees. So they're the largest consulting firm in the world. What that means is arguably the most, they're the most influential firm in the world in terms of changing the arc of capitalism. And the reason they've come to us is all of their clients are saying, et cetera, help us figure out how we transition to at the very least carbon neutrality, if, if not carbon negative. Yeah. Um, help us figure it out because we have no freaking idea, but we know we need to. Uh, and so that's that's our partnership with Accenture called the Reasonable Change. I am, and there's a number of other partnerships out there, but what I love about it is these are not sponsorship relationships. Mm -hmm. These are really co-created initiatives that are aligned with the core trajectory of these very large firms um, to help them successfully make the transition themselves as well as transition their their clients. And what we learned is, you know, one way to put it is um, the climate crisis. Uh, arguably, I would is existential at least for our species and, and biodiversity. I yep. uh, and winning slowly when it comes to the climate crisis is the same thing as losing. Mm -hmm. We we can't do this at a slow rate of change. It just won't yeah. work. And so that that was a realization we had about a decade ago with the reasonable. And the question was, okay, we have this great bottom up strategy, find these really disruptive entrepreneurs and trying to help them become the future titans of industry and dis disrupt and influence industry to, you know, transition. But that's not fast enough. We also need a top down approach. Yeah. And that's where our partnership model comes into play. And, and how we bring those together is, I really don't like this word, but I am, I, there's a lot of synergy. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's an overused word, right? But the way we help the world's largest institutions transition is by giving them relational access to the disruptors and entrepreneurs that are really the beacons of where that market's moving. And in the process, that helps scale up yeah. those entrepreneurial solutions very quickly as well. That was way too long of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good one. But it's very, um, a lot of foresight there because at the moment we are seeing at last a good deal of innovation and a good deal of really genuine collaborations between public, private uh, yeah. and corporate and, and startup and things really, as you've been doing for some years, you know, that, that synergy symbiosis of really, you know, making it work. And it, it does. I mean, I've, yeah. I've worked with, I've had the pleasure to work with a number of unreasonable fellows and, and some of those have been investing in Barclays like Naked Energy, for example. So it, yes. it, it yeah. genuinely, you know, it, it works. I want to talk about the entrepreneurs because I, I always revert yeah. back to this nine in 10 that you, you, you touched on already about, you know, entrepreneurship is just it's bloody hard, you know, and it, and, and yeah. you need a lot of things to be working. And some of it is, you know, luck and timing. Yeah. A lot of it is what you can do and who, you're, who you've got around you, yes. essentially. But it's really tough. So I want to focus on that. But just very briefly, if you could share us the, the five areas of, of impact that, that Unreasonable will get involved with. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So the, the vast majority of uh, the portfolio companies that we support are in the, in the space of, I would say, climate tech. But the, mm -hmm. the five areas... The first one is education and learning, and that includes um, K-12 education I, um, all the way through um, upskilling, reskilling, uh, you know, the future of our workforces. Um, next category is energy and the environment, mm -hmm. um, and that's looking at um, how do we move from an industrial and digital economy to an ecological one is kind of how I would, I would frame that. Um, Third category, which is related to the second, is food and water. Mm -hmm. I am, and that's really about kind of rethinking uh, our approach to agriculture, drinking water, nutrition, I am, I meat production, whatever yeah. that might be. That relates to the fourth one, which would say health, 
healthcare medicine. And then the last last category, which is a little bit of a catch-all, is what we'll refer to as new frontiers. This is both about um, supporting breakthrough innovations that are making a substantive difference in emerging markets, mm -hmm. as well as working with um, say some really deep tech uh, solutions right. um, that we believe are, are emerging um, to kind of define the future state of, of business that um, are oriented around solving global issues, though. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit, you mentioned the word um, earlier, um, you know, talking about for-profit solutions and you're finding this community, this brotherhood, as, yeah. as you put it, right, that are trying to use that for good. And the way we think about it is, look, profit is not a good or bad thing. It's, it's agnostic. It's the tool. It can be used to do really bad yeah. things or really magnificently good things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but what we don't align with are entrepreneurs that just want to profiteer, right? We do look at the, at the motivation, I am, and it's not make money at all expenses yeah, <laughs> by, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. And what's interesting is there are some um, great uh, solutions uh, now that are coming into the space because people are realizing, whoa, hang on, I can make more money doing the right thing. I am, if their motivation yeah. is just to make more money, though, I am, those are not entrepreneurs that we align with. Um, we also think they're going to underperform in the long term because yeah, yeah. that motivator is much less powerful than the motivator of, wow, hang on, I, I can help define progress in our time. Yeah. That's going to drive them through, you know, that really hard roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. It drives um, the individual and it drives the culture of the business. And, and from a talent and acquisition point of view, you know, companies exactly. who are truly mission and purpose led are the ones where A, people want to work and people stay, you know, and, and that's that's what's totally. necessary for, for success. Yeah, that's where I want to work, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. Let's talk about the the entrepreneurs. Again, this is your your format is again different in many ways. Now, I I, I have the pleasure to to mentor for a number of uh, clean tech accelerators yeah. and startups, and that's good fun. And 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 those are really good organisations. But yeah, this is not something you can apply for to become an unreasonable fellow. So, how did yeah. you decide how you would go about recruiting entrepreneurs and how you would go about supporting them? And, and that. I guess we'll cover that first and we'll lend into you know yep. how how you support them, I guess, on a day to day basis. But what first led you to have this model where you weren't, you know, advertising, hey, come join Unreasonable Group? You yep. know, how how did you act on that and how do you choose the people that you invite to be involved? Well, many good questions. I'm gonna to try to be <laughs> brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> no, it's mine from that it. question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, it's a great question that we started out a reasonable institute was application based. Um, we had over a thousand applications in the very first reasonable institute, which was right. shocking. Uh, what we realized it was very easy to be a big fish in a pond when you were actually the only fish. I uh, had nothing to do with our credibility <laughs> It had everything to do with taking a stance before another organization had. Yeah. And that gets back, you know, Genesis of Unreasonable. Once again, it was my own selfish desire to seek refuge amongst a community of entrepreneurs trying to solve societal and environmental challenges at thinking about global scale. That didn't exist. Had it had existed, I would have applied to be in it, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't. And so I felt like we had to build it. Um, and, uh, and with, with that, um, that was the first model, much more like an incubator or accelerator. Right. I am. Um, we'd get applications. We'd source those down. We'd vet them. We'd select you know twenty to twenty five of them. I am. Um, what happened about two years into running the Reasonable Institute was, I am um, this idea that impatience is a virtue, right? As as we said, as I mentioned earlier, like winning slowly is the same yeah. thing as losing when it comes to the climate crisis and a lot of these other kind of existential challenges that we face. I am. Um, and two two years after launching a Reasonable Institute, what was phenomenal is there were a number of other incubators and accelerators that were starting to pop up around the world supporting yeah. entrepreneurs that wanted to have an impact. But there are thousands, literally thousands now today. There's still not enough, but, but there is a good amount of support. And so after two years of running the Reasonable Institute in that kind of early stage application-based model, I realized, wow, there is two things. One, impatience is a virtue. Second one is there's a huge dearth of support. Yep. Yeah for entrepreneurs that are, you have graduated beyond that accelerator stage. I am, they have something that works. I am, they may be six or seven years into the formation of their business. They're now saying, hey, I brought distributed solar to 2 million households. My question is, how do I take it to 200 million? I am, and the, their challenges are unique yep. and they're just as hard. Uh, and there was not an organization in the world that was supporting them uh, that, that we knew of. 
I am other than just, in, I mean, not just, but other than investment funds, mm -hmm. um, which is great, but that's a different kind of support. Um, and so that was actually the genesis of a reasonable group, which is, uh, which is we you know, reorganized, became a for-profit and said, we're going to focus really on growth equity companies. We're going to try to find the most effective solutions in the world. That's really right. our theory of change. And then give them a collaborative advantage for life so that they, you know, we help increase their odds of realizing their full potential much faster. I am, and the entirety of this model was predicated on a belief that, okay, we need to build the most uh, impactful portfolio of companies in the world. Um, and where that immediately took us to is two hard challenges, which is why we realized, okay, the best position growth stage entrepreneurs on the planet, CEOs, they're not going to apply for anything. Yeah. Um, the reason they are doing so well is because they're so damn focused um, and their heads are down. And so that, that changed our model to let's do primary research and let's handpick and let's privately invite the best position companies of the world. Second issue, though, was I am... I, if you're talking about friction from them coming into the reasonable fellowship, yeah. I we realized we can't charge them anything. So there was a time friction around applying, yeah. um, which already self-selected out, we thought, the most compelling companies. But then there's a financial piece of friction, which is not only can we not charge them anything, we need to cover all their costs. We want right. to support them for life. Um, and we do not, we can't put any rights, warranties, guarantees, preferences, anything like that in our relations with them because that would deter the very best from participating. Right. Um, so that's how we developed our partnerships model, which was yeah, yeah. kind of scratched our head. I remember having like a, oh, this is hard <laughs> moment. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea how to do this. And then realized, well, if we can deliver on our promise of bringing together the most compelling solutions in the world, I then these really large multinationals would probably kill to have relational proximity to them. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so... It's all predicated on our ability to identify and then attract, um, you know, this this kind of unmatched portfolio of typically more growth stage uh, yeah. solutions um, that are really well positioned to achieve the goals that we all need them to achieve. Yeah, I am, and uh, that's that's why we handpick and privately invite versus do applications. It makes sense. I mean, certainly there is, as you say, there are many incubators and accelerators that support growth stage or you know precede companies and that's yeah. great you could They're, do more yeah. absolutely yeah um but then you had that you know that that valley of death so-called where you've you've kind of got some traction Big but up. to scale then that's where things get really tough right so well, it, it's well, differently hard. tough it's kind of <laughs> yeah right differently tough it's always hard i mean the reason why the multinationals these are some of the biggest firms in the world are partnering with us is because it's hard still yeah. <laughs> it's like it's always hard i am and i um you know, we just really felt like there was a significant dearth of support from growth stage companies. And that's largely because of the business model. Yeah. Like most incubators or accelerators are investors first, mm -hmm. most of them. I am, And so they charge in one way or another where it's, uh, yeah, they have guarantees of investment or they're actually putting capital in and, you know, getting uh, to, yeah. specific allocations of the company. I am, And what we realize is if we have any financial friction, for CEOs to become a part of the fellowship, then we failed from the start in terms of finding basically the and working with the most compelling solutions of the world. And so that's that's what kind of challenged us to figure it out. I um, was very lucky to, the, maybe the last thing I'll just mention there is our partners do mm -hmm. I have, especially longstanding ones like Barclays and et cetera, they have a great deal of, I would say, creative courage mm -hmm. and fiscal foresight to have partnered with us so early on. I am, I am, but uh, but that's now what's you know really paying off yeah. um, for them and, and and for the companies we support. But it, it was it was not an easy pitch, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can imagine. And, you know, we sign multi we only sign multi year contracts up front. I uh, and, and so that's that's a there's a lot of belief yeah, that yeah. went into that. Um, and, and kind of thank goodness it's uh, you know uh, hopefully surpassed expectations our relationships, but. Um, they were pretty bold and originally partnering with us. Yeah, would have liked to have seen that pitch. But um, so <laughs> go, go back to the entrepreneurs. I've said it's super tough. Uh, I, I said I'm a pleasure to, to know and have worked with a number of, of fellows of, uh, yeah. of, of Unreasonable. In terms of how you support, because again, there's different stages, but it's also different from from, yeah. from most accelerators. I've had the pleasure of, of obviously being at some of the Unreasonable uh, yeah. days and, and get to meet and support in, in, in some you know small ways. But tell us a little bit about how 
you provide value. It's difficult to say you provide value because provide value, actually you're not actually charging anything, but how, how do you yeah. give support and give um, yeah. uh, the urge, the push to really drive these businesses forward and entrepreneurs to give them support to keep going when, when it is exceptionally tough? Yeah, I think, I think there's really four main categories of, of support that we provide. I am it, and I mentioned it is lifelong support. So mm -hmm. if I, we bring in the individual and the company, the company's not lifelong support. We support the company for its life. Right. <laughs> That's it's right. Uh, but we do support the individual uh, into perpetuity, you know, so long as they remain aligned with, in essence, our code of conduct and values. Yep. Um, but I, so the types of support, um, First one I uh, is you know, we call mentors, and you're one of them. Uh, so you're familiar with this, but we have about a thousand mentors. And and I think so. You know, mentorship may not even be the best word. That maybe the best word is contemporaries, right? Mm -hmm. A network of about a thousand contemporaries who bring in unique aspects of experience, resources, and connections, and who care, right? They're on this journey with these CEOs yep. of ushering in a new wave of business and harnessing it to create a more regenerative and just future. And I am at, you know, those thousand plus mentors um, are, I am available uh, to be connected directly. I am it, for all of our fellows at any time. Um, so that that's an aspect of it is having um, basically a thousand advisors yeah. who you can kind of reach out to uh, at any moment. Um, the second aspect I am, is actually each other. And, and that's why maybe the word mentors is the right word, because oftentimes the best mentors for CEOs are are the other CEOs because, that are in the fellowship. Yeah. I am, so we, we have just over now 360 uh, uh, ventures in, in the fellowship, and we connect them with one another. I am, of course, to have shared learnings, but also to coach each other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we learned a lot from organizations like YPO um, and EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, huge networks of thousands, tens of thousands of CEOs. Yeah. I am, and the primary value for them is that they connect to each other in small groups once a month, they do peer-to-peer -peer coaching. So we, we call those unreasonable groves, uh, kind of inspired by Redwoods. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, and I am, our CEOs are meeting monthly, sometimes for two to four hours. I'm with a small select group of about 10 I uh, unreasonable fellows. Right. I am, and they're talking about what's hardest, typically in best, but really hardest in life and work and family. I am, and they're coaching each other through that. Yeah. I am, I, and that that peer to peer I uh, coaching is, I think, invaluable for entrepreneurs, especially because oftentimes this journey is very lonely, and they're kind of in a class of their own. Uh, so there's that. Then there's investor access or investment access. Mm -hmm. So. If a reasonable fellow is raising a round of financing, we're typically the second organization to note. The first is their board, <laughs> and then the second is us. I am, and, and that's because we work with about a thousand sources of capital. So sovereign wealth funds, private equity groups, I, you know, family offices, venture firms, foundations, um, kind of really across the board. I am, and when a fellow is raising, I am, we can run kind of the details of their round across the preferences yeah. of these investors and we can do matchmaking. And, and so we're constantly doing investor connectivity to our fellows when they ask for it. And I'd say the last one um, is financing is critical and it's needed to achieve the goals that we all have when we talk about leveraging what works. Leverage is a very important word, uh, but typically the best dollar uh, you can get as a company is not financing, it's revenue. Yeah. Uh, and so we're a uh, customer connectivity. That's largely now through our partnerships as well, but we are constantly, uh, and, and through actually our mentor community, um, looking to connect our entrepreneurs into potential customers yeah. and their supply chains and services and products um, as, as a, a you know, opportunity for them to sell at, at scale. And those are very hard rooms to typically get into as, as an entrepreneur to kind of get into the C-suite or boardroom of Fortune 100 companies. And yeah. we try to help with that in any way we can. Yeah, yeah. and all those things are, are hugely critical as we touched on before. The, 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 the number of plates you have to spin as a founder, CEO of, of an organization or the leadership team is phenomenal. But one of the things that came across from my involvement so far uh, and broadly to working with so many entrepreneurs uh, out there is that you know, fundraising, growth, culture, product evolution, product market fit, revenue, profit, all these things are, are massively difficult. But one of the things that's easily forgotten is that mm. everyone's a human being. A human, yes. And you have families, you have challenges, you have illnesses, exactly. you have relationships, you have all this kind of stuff that that, that kind of you sits above health. everything. Yeah, yeah. Everything. 
everything, everything. I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, a great analogy that a lot of people use is a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And I am, and I, I'm, you know, the, the soft stuff, if we call it that, that's the hard stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that is way harder. Um, and so the biggest support, I'm glad you touched on that, David. Thank you. I think the biggest area of support that we have is, is we make the journey less lonely. Yeah. I am, and we support the, right. Our, everything I was just talking about was really about the company. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the person I am. And, and, and I think that that's actually most important. I am, you know, the, the stress I am can be um, overwhelming and it can be deadly. We've had a number of fellows that have gone through cardiac arrest right. I am, or they've had, you know, they've needed multiple full body blood transfusions because an ulcer I you know, ate through their intestines. I mean, like it's, and they bled out like this. It's horribly stressful yeah. to just be an entrepreneur, let alone be an entrepreneur who's trying to bring in a market a solution that has never existed before and that nobody believes is even possible when you have global aspirations, not because you want to scale the company, but because you need to solve the problem. Yeah. I am, and, and that can be all consuming and it all consuming can become really dangerous. And so yeah. um, for us, I am creating a extremely safe place where entrepreneurs can be vulnerable, deeply vulnerable yeah. and talk about what is hardest and yes, in work, which oftentimes they can't do, but they feel like they can't do, but also in life and in family. I am. And then to wrap them with support around that is, is absolutely critical. And sometimes the biggest takeaway for our fellows is I, uh, you know, focusing on, on wellness yeah, yeah. and that, you know, health and family actually does come first yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it has to come first in a long time or else you're not going to be around or you're certainly not going to think nearly as clearly uh, to be able to achieve the goals that you have. So totally agree with you, David. Yeah, it's yeah. a hard it, journey to walk. It's hard and it's sometimes it's easier as an entrepreneur to think, well, I'll work a few extra hours or I'll, I'll, I'll make a few more calls or you know make a few more pitches or whatever the you know, situation is. But those yeah. things are, whilst they're difficult, they're, they're kind of almost automatic to some extent. But having that and saying actually my child is unwell or my, my I've got an issue with my relationship or you know my my parents are suffering or yeah. whatever it might happen to be that totally. life is happening that's the stuff where nobody it, there's no easy answer right and that's where you the, the peer support it's interesting at the last event in sorry that we had a, a conversation around the table and pretty much everybody flagged it was a family issue not a work issue when we were just talking generally yeah. about what's what's you know keeping you up at night at the moment now keeping you up there was the obvious yeah. work stuff but a lot of it was around life because we, yeah. we don't live outside of life right entrepreneurship is part of <laughs> life totally uh, a, a thousand percent i am couldn't agree more and it's why you know in this mentor community we have relationship psychologists mm -hmm. and we have wellness coaches and we have meditation experts and we have trauma experts and right. we don't just have you know, investors and you know global thought leaders in business and i am I, you know, we kind of need an, an arsenal of support and to really look at supporting the individual yeah. I am and, you know, the dynamics in life that they're walking through as they're trying to do this impossible task as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been amazing. I've loved my involvement and I look forward to meeting with you later in the week at the at, at the next uh, UK uh, cohort, at least. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you, Daniel, because I, I first got involved in clean tech, as I mentioned, by kind of accident in 2007 and, and the world's very different now for good and for bad in terms of our, our, our yeah. sector. Are you more or less optimistic that we can make the differences we need to make now than you were when you started on Reasonable Institute? I've also gotten older. <laughs> <laughs> this this great hair wasn't there then. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of it. I am, I used to be what I would categorize as the blind optimist. Mm -hmm. I am... Now, when, it, when I said I was optimistic, I would always caveat that and say, but I'm an impatient optimist. I, and, and I would say, you know, COVID and having a lot of time <laughs> to be introspective, I am, and I, you know, to see, to really viscerally kind of feel into the challenges that are faced around the world. Um, my posture's changed a little bit. I would okay. say I'm, I'm a possibilist. I'm not, I'm not an optimist, but I am a possibilist. And I believe that both futures are possible. Right. We can, you know, work through these remarkably tough times, come out on the other side and actually transition if you know, from industrial and digital into, I genuinely believe in it, into an ecological economy and society, one that is focused on relationships, right? Ecology is a study of relationships with ourselves, with each other, which are ha with our habitat. And, I, and there, are, there are the solutions there. 
uh, you know, but to step into a much more regenerative relationship, uh, you know, kind of mind, body, spirit, soul, the environment, the whole thing. Yeah. I am, but I'm a possibilist because uh, there's another, you know, much more dark possible future. And yeah. what that to me makes me feel is it, it, it drives me. It says, okay, either future is possible. We all need to play our part. And by we all, I really mean we all. And this comes yeah. down to, uh, you know, how we consume, uh, how, how we eat, how we vote. Um, but of course it comes down to the work that we lead as well. If we're privileged enough to be able to, I would say, choose uh, the work that we want to lead. But, you know, everything, everything I'm wearing on my body is secondhand. Nothing, nothing is new. I am a, and uh, we can all make decisions like that in our yeah. day-to-day lives. I am certainly, I am. But when we are privileged enough to be able to align our work with uh, creating a better future, then then I think I think we. My take is we have not just a moral obligation, but uh, an opportunity to do it. Yeah, you know, I am because if you know you can align that work with meaning or your investments with meaning, um, life's richer because <laughs> you're a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. And there is no middle ground. Yeah. That would be the other thing I'd say. So how do we all strive to become part of the solution? If we do that, I think we're going to have a really great future. Yeah. I am. And I'm not foolish to think that it's not going to be extremely hard. I am. I for you know so many people. I am, but uh, I think we can get there. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It is certainly tough, but like you say, life is much more rich if you're at least on the right side of hopefully on the right side of history. But uh, yeah. that's yeah. Uh, hopefully, and yeah. we always have to scrutinize that <laughs> because many times, many breakthrough solutions have you know come into the market thinking they're on the right side of history, and they, and what they have done is measured intended consequences. Yeah, yeah. Right, you you can spend time with an oil executive who's an amazing person, and they're they're looking at the world and they're saying, "Look, the ambulance that you want to take to the hospital, that's powered and made out of fossil mm. fuels." Right, the school bus that your kids ride, that doesn't happen without our industry. They're right; they're totally right. But what business has forgotten to do in the past is measure unintended consequences, and we that's have why we're to measure we are, both. Right? Right. If we don't pay attention to the negative externalities and measure those, then I think we'll just repeat the clean tech industry will repeat the same mistakes that we made in the past. And so it's both focus, yes, on measuring the impact you want to have. But please, for the love of everything, measure the impact you don't want to have, yeah, yeah. because what we measure is an indicator of what we value, but it changes behavior over time. Absolutely. And I think we need to st- stop kidding ourselves, in essence, and then we'll create not not a sustainable future sustainability is about minimizing our negative impacts it's not good enough humanity needs to come into harmony yeah. with the natural world that's the only way in the long term we'll survive or else we'll be more like a virus yeah. on the planet and so i am how do we become you know really regenerative is is the key and and that that comes down to um, not having waste, uh, you know, in, yeah. in our approaches. The, the big, I'm, I'll stop blabbering. The big challenge. No, it's, it's, it's let's say we could talk for hours, and uh, hopefully we can yeah. pick up the conversation. Later. For now, it's yeah. been great to talk to you, Daniel. Thanks very much for joining us. For yeah. the audience, you can find out more about Unreasonable Group on the episode page, where we share uh, links to the websites and various places that you can find out more information. Uh, for now, Daniel, thanks very much, and for everybody else, I hope you enjoyed the episode.